Jeff's over there. Jeff's over there. Brad's That's home. for uh, those that aren't here tonight. <laughs> if they want to listen to what I say. Okay. Four chapters, four and five, and the beginning of chapter six, sort of all go together. Um, it, it is a. Uh, is the end of the letters to the churches. And then John says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Now, what did we just read uh, from last week? Uh, who, what does he give himself the title? What does Jesus give himself the title of? But the, um, the one who opens doors that no one can shut. I'm sorry, that was two weeks ago, wasn't it? Yes, two weeks ago when we studied Philadelphia, he gave himself the title of "I set, uh, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it." You have, um, oh, sorry, I, I skipped the verses. So, verse seven, he gives himself the title: "He who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no one opens." And so here we have at the beginning of this narrative of the throne room of God. We have John seeing a door that is standing open. I think that just is incredible that the door of heaven is open. I mean, that, that was not the case until Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has opened the door to heaven by what he has done, by his death and resurrection. John turns and sees the door to heaven open. I just think that's beautiful. And a voice, a first, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you the things that must, play, that must take place after this. So when is after this? <laughs> That's the, Reed got it. After this, it's the future, right? It's the future. At this, the time that he's talking about is the time of the churches. And he says every, you know, he just went through the, the letters to the seven churches. We are still in, as far as I can understand anything, uh, I believe we are still in the church age. Those letters still apply to us today. Nothing has changed yet. But there will come a time when things do change. And he's saying here, he says, after, these are things that must take place after this. After this age of churches when, 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 that we just looked through. And examine ourselves according to. Okay. Then John says immediately. I'm just going to go ahead and read now. Uh, I'm going to read this as a narrative. And then we'll go back and, and look at it. So immediately I was in the spirit. And behold a throne in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he who had sat there. Was like jasper. And a sardis stone. In appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne. In appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on those thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like a calf. The third was like, had the face of a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each had, having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night singing holy Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits upon the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him, who sit in the throne, who sit on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before him, saying, You are worthy, O Lord to give glory and honor and power for you created all things and by 
your will. They exist and were created. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even look at it. So I wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of Judah, the Lion, I'm sorry, of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose the seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, and the seven spirits of God set out into the whole earth. Which are the seven spirits of God sent out into the whole earth. Verse 7. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard a voice and many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and the strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such that are in the sea and all of them and all that are in them I heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever then the four living creatures said amen and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever now, that's a lot, and it's powerful, but it, it, it's one scene, so I didn't feel like I, I wanted to break it up. It's two chapters, but it's one scene, and uh, we can get caught up in the imagery, and a lot of people do, and I even looked online, and I was going to pull up some paintings of the throne room based on these readings, and they're all super lame, okay? They're, they're, all, they're all like, you know, you want to squint and go, that doesn't look like very pretty to me. It looks weird, and especially when they try to draw the four creatures with heads that have eyes and multiple eyes. and It just doesn't look right. And that's because it was meant to be read. It wasn't meant to be seen. And the things that he is describing here, he's doing his best. John is out of his depths, right? He is a two-dimensional being in a, in a five-dimensional place. You know, you can understand that he's he is, uh, but he's doing his best, and he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So all these things mean something. He's not wrong in what he says. It's just that we have to struggle to understand it. But the narrative, we can certainly understand. The narrative that he is telling us is pretty straightforward. And that is that he turns, uh, going all the way back to verse 2, he's in the Spirit, and he sees the throne. Now, the throne is described in many places in the Bible. Um, if you want to jot them down to go look them up later, Second Chronicles 18, 18 is the one. There's several places in Psalms. We're going to look at some of the throne uh, passages. Psalms 11, 4 talks about the uh, throne of heaven. Hebrews 8, 1, Hebrews 12, 2. We're actually going to look those up. But in Matthew 5, 33, and in Isaiah 61, 66, 1, in both of those places, Heaven itself is described as the throne of God. That heaven is the throne of God and earth is his footstool. And so we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at this. We're looking, or John is looking into a throne within the throne. All of heaven is God's throne. 
but this is something special. Something special is happening at this one place or this one idea that he's looking at. And he looks and he sees one set on the throne. Now, for just for a second, we need to kind of take a look back and say, heaven is the throne of God. And this goes into what at least the men have been studying on Wednesday night. Heaven is the throne of God. God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit? What? Yes. 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 The correct answer is yes. And we see them all here. John says immediately, I was in the Spirit. We can only per- John can only perceive this because he is in the Spirit. But that's not all. If we look down in verse 5, it says there were seven lamps of fire that were burning on the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. They're there. They're, they're, they're in the throne room. They're on the throne of heaven. Then in verse um, 2, it says, one that sat upon the throne. This is the same one that is holding the scroll. Who is this? God the Father. God the Father. That's correct. We know it's not God the Son because, if you remember the narrative, when we get down uh, in the bottom, nobody is found to be able to take the scroll until they bring up the Son, the, 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 the Lamb. And where is the Lamb? He is in the midst of the throne and in the midst of the creatures. He's there. He's, he's on the throne of heaven as well. And he takes the scroll from the one who sits on the throne, which is God the Father. So God the Father holds the scroll, God the Son takes the scroll, and all of this is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, So, that's a beautiful thing. Um, Something that that I found helpful when I was reading this and researching it and trying to understand it, it was a word that kept being used over and over, and this word was transcendent. And I'm like, do I know? I heard that, I hear that word all the time. But could I write down a definition of transcendent? So I asked Faith, I said, without looking on Google, what would you say transcendent meant? And she gave me a definition. And I'm like, yeah. But she took a while. And I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> so, like, so I spent some time trying to trying to get a biblical definition. Because just because you look it up in the dictionary doesn't mean that's what you know people mean by transcendent when they're talking about the Bible and God. But this is the definition that I found in the Bible dictionary, which are in a dictionary. Uh, religious, it wasn't a Bible dictionary. It was, uh, well, it was kind of like a concordance. Not a concordance. What am I trying to think of? Commentary. That's what I'm trying to say. Existing apart from, but not restricted from, and not subject to the limitations of the material universe. Does that clear as mud anything up for you? Clear as mud. Yeah. <laughs> So then, I, so then I began to look for examples of transcendence. Like, how can I get my mind around this? And I found a, a great, uh, it was a great commentary. I don't even know, I didn't write down who wrote it. But it was talking about prayer. It says, when do we experience transcendency? And it's when we, through prayer, are sanctified. When we submit to God for something that we don't want. We're transcending ourselves. If, if if, if we're praying to God and we're asking him for something and he says no, there's something we want, but it's something he's telling me, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not my will for you. And we submit to that. That is transcending our physical, that our, our material self, our, our, what we want, what we want to be happy, right? And instead, we're submitting to his view, so we're transcending ourselves and admitting that there's a higher view, an exalted view. Does that make sense? Does that help a little bit? It's kind of a hard word. It's a hard concept for me anyway. But when we look at the throne room, we see that God is transcendent. He's not limited by the throne room. He's not just in the throne room. He is everywhere because he is God. Um, When we talk about time, we talk about God as transcendent of time. That means he's not bound by time. Right? It doesn't mean he's outside of time. It means he's not bound by it. Because to be outside of something means that you're restricted from it. But he's transcendent of it. Okay? I don't know if that helps or not. But um, then we uh, we get to the four living creatures, which I, I found was, was interesting. Anybody have anything to add on transcendency? This transcendent aspect of the throne room? I just don't want us to get the idea that God 
is, uh, and you know, where is Jesus? Jesus is at the right hand of God in the throne room, but he's also in our hearts. He's also with us through the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God. So we have to keep that in mind that God is not limited by being in one place. Or, you know. Okay. Four living creatures. Very interesting. I did a lot of, I went on a whole uh, thing that we could be here all night, but I went on a whole spiral through the four living creatures. They are, for their purpose, as far as in these two chapters, is to worship. They also have an aspect of judgment, because if we look down and we, and we kind of cheat a little bit and look into chapter 7, we see that the seals are starting to be broken. And every time a seal is broken, one of the four, one of the four living creatures, the first four seals, there's a living creature there that says, come and see. It, and it's a different creature every time. So there's an aspect of these creatures that's involved in God's judgment, but it's kind of mysterious and weird, and I didn't get into it. But, but what is important to these two chapters is that they are worshiping. Look in chapter 4, when they first cry out, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come, they're, who are they praising in that moment? Lord God Almighty. The Father, the one who sits on the throne, the one who's holding the scroll. In chapter 4, they're praising God the Father. And that's important because of what they do in chapter 5. So in chapter 5, they start praising. And who are they praising here? You are worthy to take the scroll. They're praising the Son. Yeah, God the Son. So they, and then who follows them in this worship? I'm sorry? The 24 yes, elders. the 24 elders. Whenever they start to praise, it says, whenever they start to praise, the 24 elders get up and throw their crowns down in front of them. Which makes me all want to tear up to think about this. But he makes us worthy to have crowns. He gives us the crowns, and then we use those crowns to worship him. It's just a beautiful picture in my head. But, yeah, so the creatures are leading worship, but then the 24 elders are the ones that are engaged in this worship. And then I don't want us to look past the bowls. Uh, I thought that was a beautiful aspect. Um, I lost it here. Four, eight? Seven, yeah. five, five, eight. Five, eight. Oh. Thank mm -hmm. you. Now, when, uh, when they take this for the four living creatures, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp, which is a symbol of worship. But, I mean, you don't have to be caught up in the symbology. They, it might be literal harps. It doesn't matter. The point is they had a harp. But then they had golden bowls full of incense. Incense, are, you know, that smells good. Anybody, from, anybody live long enough to know what incense is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's stuff that smells good. But the incense that they used in the worship were special names that God had ordained to put together. In the temple? In the tabernacle. In the tabernacle. And, but these incense are also special made because these incense are the prayers of the saints. Mm -hmm. Our prayers are sweet smelling to God. It just makes me want to cry. I'm a wild emotion all of a sudden, but that's just getting to me. Um, what, a, what a beautiful thing. I mean, it, to me, my, my prayers are, I, I don't view my prayers as beautiful or sweet smelling. I view them as clumsy and and then and, and usually, you know, uh, filled with, I don't know, Lord, why? Ah, you know, I feel like a two-year-old. Um, I don't, but he sees them as beautiful. He sees them as sweet smelling uh, as we surrender to him and as we, as we depend upon him and as we rely on him. That's pleasing to the Lord. And so uh, I just think that's, that's beautiful, that picture. And it's not just the 24 elders. Notice down in verse 11. That who joins the 24 elders? Many angels, right? It says many angels on the throne, living creatures, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. In other words, they couldn't be numbered. They were, they were just multitudes. And so um, just a, a, beautiful, a beautiful worship scene in heaven. And I think it's awesome that the, that the Trinity is there, uh, represented on the throne. It's just beautiful. Okay, so now let's, let's dig in a little bit to what does this mean? What can we gain 
in, in our sanctification by looking at this, the scene in heaven. Well, first we see that, um, that the throne room in chapters 4 and 5 that we just got through looking at, we just got through studying, our place is a place of praise. Right? The four creatures praise, they lead the elders to praise, and then everybody else joins them in praise. The throne room is a place of praise. Who has 1 Thessalonians 5, 16? 16 through 18. Go ahead. Uh, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We are, if, if Jesus Christ is on the throne of our hearts, if we're involved in this throne room, then we're expected to pray. We're expected to come with thanksgiving, which we all did a while ago when we were in here praying together. Um, but we're, we're to be involved in that, in that praise. If, if we're going through our prayer life and we're not praising God, if we're just requesting things or complaining, we're, we're missing out on Him being our Lord. Because the, the first aspect of the throne room is praise. So we need to find something we can be thankful for and start there and just start thanking Him for those things. It may be a horrible, really bad day. What is this book? Horrible, no good, no good, really horrible, no good, really bad day. But it was a day, right? The sun shined. Um, if nothing else, you can thank him for the time. This is what I always start out when I just can't find anything, when I'm just in a really bad place. I can at least start with, thank you, Lord, for the time right now to pray to you. Right? I always have that. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be praying. I think it's good to remember, too, that there's a throne room with a throne that's always occupied. Oh, yeah. And that's something to praise God for. That's something we can praise God for, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, who has Psalms 89 4? Yeah. Supposed to look these up before him. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. God's throne is everlasting. Kind of what you're saying. Yes, it's always occupied, but it is everlasting. For all generations, forever. What is that? How does that translate to our sanctification? How does that translate to an application for us? Well, who has Matthew 6 19? Oh, I do. Okay. Nineteen through twenty-one. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Keep going. Was it nineteen through twenty-one? Mm -hmm. Through twenty-one. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is. There your heart will be also. So, in the throne room, there's no, there's no rust. In the throne room, there's no deterioration. In the throne room, it is safe. Nobody can steal it. It's under God's authority. In the throne room, it lasts forever. Right? The throne lasts forever. He says His throne to, to last forever. It's an everlasting throne. And so when we place our treasures there, not only are our treasures safe, but what does it say at the end of that passage? Where our treasures are, our hearts will be also. We want to be there. Oh, well, in the throne room. I thought the throne room passage was still up. That's okay. Then. We want to be in the throne. Okay. Next, who has Psalms 89 14? I bet it's Faith because she got all the Psalms. I guess. No, that's I got it. That's oh. We're going back and forth. Okay. 89 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. The throne is righteous. Mm -hmm. Okay, It is a throne of righteousness. Now, in, in that, that's almost a little scary. should be. 
Because what do we got? What do, what business do we have in a throne room that's righteous? But the answer to that question is in Romans three twenty one. Who has Romans three twenty one? But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Wow. You really have to read through twenty six though. <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. Is key. Go for it, girl. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. 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 But there is no difference to God Christ's righteousness on us mm -hmm. than righteousness. Just what he has done for us blows me away. We go into the throne room with the righteousness of Christ upon us. Not our own righteousness. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you for reading that. Alright, who has Hebrews 8.1? Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. The throne of the majesty in the heavens. The throne room is full of majesty. It's called the, the majesty. It's a capital M in my Bible. The majesty of the heavens. It goes on to say in chapter 2, the ministry of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Beautiful picture of the throne room. How do we interact with a throne that is full of majesty? James 4 10. Who has James 4 10? Yes. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I love the, the King James there says, exalt you. I mean, it means the same thing. But we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. That's our job. That's our part. And it's just a perfect description of what he just said about it, the righteousness. We humble ourselves and he lifts us up. If we're going to be involved in the throne room, we need to come humbly, Right? Not with our own agendas and our own the things that we want for our life or the things we want for maybe, you know, very good intentions, maybe things we want for our kids or our kids' lives. But we need to come humbly, Lord, what is your will in these situations? All right, Psalms 9, 7. But the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. Established his throne for judgment. The throne is a throne of judgment. We, and later in Revelation, it goes into great detail about the white throne judgment. The one we don't want to be at. We'll be there, but we won't be being judged by it. Um, we're judged at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, which is a good thing. <laughs> but anyway, the throne room is a place of judgment. But not just judgment. Perfect judgment is what it said, right? And um, righteous judgment. Romans, and how to... So what does that mean to us? Romans 12, 19. Who has that one? Okay. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. In verse 20, you don't like to stop. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay. Now that doesn't mean a lot of people think that means, well, I'm just gonna nasty you to death. The more I, <laughs> the more I nasty you, the more you're gonna. No, you. 
if you ever tried that, a lot of times people go, oh, he really, he likes me. He's forgiven me. You know, he's, he's just, you know, it doesn't mean they're going to go home and feel guilty about whatever they did. That doesn't want to, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about leaving room for the wrath of God. Your job is to love your enemy and let God take about, talk, deal with the justice. Okay? Don't be nice to somebody just so they'll go home and feel bad about it. <laughs> that, that's sort of defeating. They probably won't. <laughs> yeah, they probably won't. That's kind of defeating the purpose. All right. Um, y'all are unlocking that passage way too much. <laughs> uh, okay, Second Chronicles eighteen eighteen. Chronicles eighteen eighteen. Oh, look, I turned right to it. All right, eighteen eighteen says. Then Micaiah said, "Therefore, hear the word of the Lord." I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and his left. That's a symbol, or that's a picture of authority. That that all the host of heaven were at his right and his left. It's a a picture of the authority of the throne. The throne is a place of authority. How does that work out for us, who has Colossians 3.12? I do. Okay, through 17. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So here we have this aspect of us surrendering to his authority, of putting on his character. We don't get to be who we want to be. We don't get to, you know, our society tells us as individuals, it's your story that matters. It's your perspective that matters. It's your individual. And the more weird your your identity is, the more authentic your identity is, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, a man who, I'm a man who identifies as a horse, you know, whatever, you know. Um, or, you know, wh- wh- whatever it is, it just adds to that individual perspective. But what he's saying here is, no, no, no. You put on these characters of Christ that I'm producing in you, that I'm making for you. And then at the end of that, and then it's woven in with this aspect of praise. He says we are called to be thankful in one body and to put on the peace of God. We're called for a lot of different things. One of the things we're called for is for suffering because we're in this world. We've been left in this world to minister to others and therefore we're going to suffer. We're called to suffer, but we're also called to be thankful and to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. And it's woven in with this this idea that we're, we're to be praising God. He says, teaching and admonishing one another by praising God singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and being glad in our hearts. Nothing teaches me more than to see it. Yeah, I don't know if y'all remember, a lot of you don't, many of, many of you probably remember Patty Sells who was dying of cancer, who would struggle and do whatever it took to get to church every Sunday as her body was just dying and she was in pain and she would come to church and worship the Lord. Mm-hmm. Nothing ministered me, to me more mm-hmm. than to see that. She ministered to me in, you know, every Sunday that she came. Anyway, all right. We can minister to one another by worshiping the Lord and being thankful and by doing all things in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus Christ because it is through him that we have righteousness and that we're able to to do these things. All right, next, next. Revelation 5, 13. Did I give that to somebody? Yeah, you gave it to me. 
and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them i heard saying blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever so here we have that the throne is a throne of honor. I just I, It says more than that there. It says glory and power. But I wanted to focus on the fact that the throne is a place of honor. And it's through glory and power that that honor exists. How do we bring honor to the throne room? Who has Hebrews 12.1? <clears throat> Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Keep going. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finishing, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have been granted to bring honor into the throne room by enduring, by setting aside the weights. And, the, you know, what does it say? Let us set aside every weight and the sin which so easily entraps us and let us run with endurance. And as we do that, we bring honor into the throne room. What a privilege that is. It's not this, well, do it, you know, you should, you know, it's not a judgment on one another. It's an honor. It's a privilege to bring honor to God by enduring, by setting these things aside, keeping our eyes, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author of our faith. And then it says, For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame of it. He hated what he was having to do. But he did it for the joy of of having us, of getting us, of saving us. And then when he was done, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The right hand is a privileged place. It is the place of honor. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, let's keep going. How am I doing on time? 17. All right, we're almost done. Um, Psalms 47, 8. That's me. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. God's throne is holy. Holy. Holy, mm -hmm. holy means separate. It means sanctified. It means set aside special. Mm -hmm. Right? It's special. It's holy. What on earth do we have to do with holy? Or with holiness? We... What? How on earth are we going to enter a throne room that is holy? 1 Peter 1 13. Okay. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former host, lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves, also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Jesus Christ makes us holy by placing on us his righteousness. As we conform to being obedient children... By putting on these things, putting on to them, putting on his character that, he's taught, that he taught us in Colossians that we just read. He makes us holy. Be holy for I am holy. We are called to be holy. And he makes us that way. Starting to get the picture that this, this throne room, which is impossible for us to enter, mm -hmm. Jesus has done so much in so many ways. Because it is, has is every aspect of it is impossible for us to deal with, and every aspect of it, Jesus Christ has has um, 
done for us, has made a way for us. It's like the song that we sang from Phil with me. He makes a way. Now that doesn't always mean that if, if you're stuck on the side of the road and you got a flat tire, there may not be a other way. He may, <laughs> that's not what it's talking about. I'm not talking about our physical... We're not, we may not have a way to pay the rent next month, but we have a way to enter the throne room, which is, way, which is more important. He has made a way in every aspect of this for us to enter the throne room of God. Psalms 103, 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. When you talk about this word sovereignty, it means he's in control. It means he knows what he's doing and, and, and how do we engage in a sovereign God. It doesn't mean he's a, I don't like this determinism where he determines every little choice that we make. I don't think that aligns with anything that we've been reading where we're supposed to guard our conduct and put on tender mercies. He's telling us to do things. He's not determining them for us. He's predestined us for those things because we're, we're his children. But he's sovereign. He's in control. And Proverbs 3.15, who has that one? She is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Did I write down the wrong passage? <laughs> I did. I mean, I wasn't sure how that. I did. I wrote down the wrong passage. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lead <laughs> not under your own understanding. Three, five, and six. Three, five, and six. Three, five, and six. Three, five, and six. I wrote. I read fifteen. You read the right one. I'm not saying. We trust in God's sovereignty, and we don't lean on our own understanding. In other words, when we don't understand what's going on in our own lives, we can still depend on his sovereignty. Lord, I don't, I don't understand why this person got cancer and this person didn't. I don't understand why this person got healed and this person died. I don't understand these things, and those things are hurtful and those things are hard. But we can depend on his sovereignty and not lean on our understanding because it's so limited. And finally, this is the last one, Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. Wow. A pure river of water of life. That is the nature of God. I mean, it, that's incredible. And Hebrews 4.16, I gave that to all of you, right? I gave it to every one of you. Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore become boldly to the throne of grace. Grace speaks to our salvation. We are saved by grace. That river of life we come boldly. Why do we come boldly? Because we're arrogant? Because Christ has done so much for us that if us, for us not to go would be arrogant, would be ungrateful. He's provided everything we need to come into the throne room and partake of that river of life. And it, you know, it's our privilege to share this information with the rest of the world, this good news with everybody we can come in contact. Hey, there's a river of life and you can partake of it. And Jesus Christ has done everything, everything for you so that you can. Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for just how wonderful your majesty is. For you, the, the how beautiful you put together over thousands of years these different writings that describe your throne that all come to this culmination in this one place at the end of your book at the end of your revelation and then we read it and we realize how awesome and scary and and and, and just um, incredible this place is it, it, it strikes us with awe and then we realize all the things that Christ has done so that we can boldly step onto this sea of crystal. That we can boldly walk into a room that is, 
that is full of your glory, that is full of holiness, that is full of your sovereignty, that is full of your grace, and drink from that grace in the river of life that flows from you. Thank you for the privilege of bringing you honor. Thank you for the righteousness that you've laid upon us through your Son. Thank you for the many things that you've done for us, that we get to reign with you, that we get that incredible privilege of standing in the throne room and throwing our crowns down, if we have any too. I don't know it says that we will, but that we get to throw these crowns down as acts of worship that you have given us. You've given us even the things that we need to worship you. It's just incredible. Lord, thank you so much. Inspire each and every one of us this week to carry this all with us, to understand the seriousness of it, to, to understand the, the importance of putting on these characters of Christ, the, to sharing the good news with others as to what uh, as to the, the fact that they can enter the throne room with us and be part of your family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Jeff, your battery's about to die. <laughs> yes, Bye, Jeff. Bye. Bye, Jeff. Love you guys. Love, Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Here you go. I'll give you back to your lovely wife. <laughs> Call you later. Hard.